Uh, well, um, welcome uh, today to the uh, uh, Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis Conversation Public Lecture Series. Um, today uh, we'll be talking about uh, the quality of justice and uh, I'm very pleased that you are able to make it here. Um, my name is John Stanhope, I work uh, at the Institute um, and uh, am involved with the organisation of uh, this conversations, this public lecture um, series. We're privileged uh, to have three very eminent Canberrans here today, all highly distinguished lawyers, and I thank each of them, Professor Stephen Parker, uh, whom I'm sure you all know, from Vice Chancellor of the University of Canberra, Dr Helen Watches, uh, the ACT Human Rights and Discrimination Commissioner, and Mr Shane Gill, a uh, senior Canberra lawyer and indeed currently president of the ACT Bar Association. Um, before beginning the presentations today, uh, I would like uh, to acknowledge that we're meeting on the lands of the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal people. Uh, I extend to them my respects, including most particularly to their elders. Um, we're still expecting a few more people today, but uh, time is pressing, so I think we'll um, commence. The uh, first uh, of the presentations today will be made by um, Professor Stephen Parker, AO. As I've said, I'm sure you're all aware that uh, Stephen is Vice-Chancellor and President of the University of Canberra, a position which he's held since 2007. Stephen moved to Australia from the United Kingdom in 1988. He graduated in honours, uh, he graduated with honours in law from the University of Newcastle at, upon time and a doctorate of philosophy from the University of Wales. He's admitted in legal practice in England and Wales, the ACT in Queensland. He's held various major research grants and has published books, uh, monographs and articles in the, uh, on, and I'm sure this is a, a part of Stephen's history that we're not so familiar with, uh, on the court system, legal ethics, family law and children's rights. And indeed in 2012, Stephen was elected a fellow of the Australian Academy of Law. He was awarded the Order of Australia in 2014. And I thank you very much, um, Stephen, for agreeing to speak with us today on what I understand was a significant area of interest to you in your academic legal career. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much, John. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very pleased to be invited here today and to speak alongside Helen and Shane. As you've heard, I've worked in human rights in the children's rights area, um, but I've also worked in legal process, legal procedure, including a, a riveting report that I wrote on the enforcement of judgment debts in Queensland. Um, I'm conscious, however, that I've been working outside of legal fields for a while now. Uh, my most recent uh, output, as we say today, um, was a monograph in 2012 about how people interpret law when they negotiate settlements, and they don't necessarily interpret law in the same way that courts do. Um, what I'll cover today is firstly talk about uh, a report that I wrote in 1988, which was commissioned by the AIJA, the Australian Institute of Judicial Administration. And then um, a follow-up study, an impact study, which was commissioned to look at what had happened since the so-called Parker Report in 2013, a collection of essays. So I'll talk about that. But then I'd like to move the debate on from that work to talk about some issues to do with access to justice and quite a novel topic, I think, um, accuracy of justice. How often might courts actually get things wrong? So uh, to begin, um, the Courts and the Public report that I wrote was commissioned by the then Federal Attorney General, uh, Darrell Williams, who wanted a study on how courts were relating to their various publics. Issues of communication, service quality, how did they know what people thought about the experience of going into uh, a court. And I was by no means the first on the scene. Um, an American academic called Thomas Church had come to Australia and had talked about the consumer perspective on courts, if you like. Um, and that's what I think led to interest to have an Australian equivalent uh, study. Um, my study was overseen by a steering group, uh, in which included uh, Robert French, who was then a judge of the federal court, and also Richard Foster, a late of this parish um, in the family court. And I had a theoretical starting point, 
uh, which was that about the role of public confidence. The more that the public are confident in the work that courts do, the more they are likely to obey courts and respect uh, courts. And um, there's plenty of work on this, but a, a, a neat little story, I, I thought, was um, an account of when, in the 1930s, Sir John Latham, a former Chief Justice, uh, met the Italian dictator Mussolini. And Mussolini asked um, Sir John Latham um, how it was that um, high court decisions which struck down legislation were obeyed or enforced. Um, Mussolini listened. This is an account by Zalman Cowan. Mussolini listened and at the end said, yes, Mr. Latham, but how does the court get its order with such far-reaching effect obeyed? Does the court have an army or an enforcing agency? Latham said, no, Mr. Mussolini. It doesn't work that way. The court simply pronounces its decision and it will be obeyed. That's how the system works. And Mussolini responded, truly, Mr. Latham, your answer is remarkable. You have anarchy in your system. And although this was an anecdote about the High Court, the moral applies at all levels. Inexplicable though it may be to a dictator, courts primarily work through voluntary acceptance of their authority. And so my study was looking at the level of confidence and could communication, good communication, good service quality improve levels of confidence um, because that might have far-reaching effect in terms of respect for law and judgments and so on. So I, um, uh, with the team, interviewed in depth 100 people, roughly half from the court system and half from users or the public. Uh, we had informal workshops. We did a big literature analysis, and we looked at the data that courts were already gathering about what their users thought, um, and published a, a report which ultimately, because it was qualitative research, was my judgment rather than anything quantitative. And my findings in brief were that courts, and this is 1997-98, courts were organised on various premises and assumptions which were not always valid, the rise of litigants in person was undermining the checks and balances. And anyway, the workload of many lawyers was such that real scrutiny uh, was inhibited um, in practice. I said that um, a culture of service was coming into courts, undoubtedly, but the public wasn't picking it up to the extent that the courts thought. In fact, to be blunt, courts were more satisfied with themselves than the data supported. Um, I found that there was no system for identifying best practice throughout Australia's court systems. I found that courts were trying things but then not evaluating whether they worked. Um, I found that user feedback was by then being sought but not analysed systematically. I found that some courts didn't appear to be safe places according to the reports of some vulnerable people who were in courts. Um, most inflammatory I found that within court organisations there was a level of antagonism between judges and administrators. I said, quoting, there appears even to be a degree of antagonism towards the judiciary from court staff and public servants, and this must presumably lead to tensions or a degree of seething in silence that cannot be described as creative. And so you can imagine seething in silence was the newspaper headlines um, about this report. Um, and I also concluded that without continuing action, there was a risk of courts becoming irrelevant in the minds of Australian society. Well, there was a big reaction um, to, to the launch, the publication of the report, a lot of media uh, interest. I, I went up for my first appearance on Talkback Radio with um, Australia's then and probably still leading um, shock jock. Um, who spectacularly misunderstood every aspect of the report and effectively asked me to justify every decision that a court had ever made that he didn't agree with. And then he invited listeners to um, ring in and say how awful courts were and how they always got it wrong, and it was basically my fault. Um, so at the end of all of this, he concluded, he said, well, thank you. Um, you seem like a reasonable bloke. Thanks for talking to us. So that's how that one ended. Um, it was also uh, the front page main story on the Weekend Australian of the following week, and there was, there was quite a big reaction. But there was also an impact, um, a longer term impact from 
these findings. Uh, courts began publicly to state their response, what they were going to do. Other countries took an interest, and um, gratifyingly, Canada um, decided to do a mirror study in that country to see whether things were the same. There was a nice passage um, in their findings, which was a much bigger study than mine, um, said that there's a culture of holding others responsible for communication breakdowns. Um, communication breakdowns are blamed on others, gave examples. Government failure to value and fund the system sufficiently. Judges blame lawyers, lawyers poor communication and availability, unwillingness to do pro bono work. Lawyers blame judges' attitudes, lack of other services, clients' inability to understand. Clerks blame the public's stupidity. Court service providers blame others for not organising or providing what is needed. And the public blames lawyers, the system as a whole, legal aid, judges, sometimes in abstract and retrospect, their own prior knowledge level. So things didn't sound glowing in, Canberra, in Canada either, that's got to be said. So that was the first part of my talk, just um, to take you back to a piece of work that I did in 1998 about the relationship between courts and their various users. Um, then the AIJA decided to review what had happened in the following 15 years and commissioned a book of essays uh, about the impact of the so-called Parker Report. And uh, Robert French, by then um, Chief Justice of the High Court, wrote the introductory chapter. And clearly a lot of work has gone on um, to try and make court services, accessibility, uh, comprehensibility um, better than it was. Um, and there's also been some offshoot work. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the work of our former colleague David Tate on court architecture, for example. He has a chapter in this book. And also um, a, very, a very interesting monograph that she's written coming out of it called Fortress or Sanctuary and looking at the ways that functionality uh, and symbolism and efficiency are balanced in modern court architecture. So all of that's really interesting uh, to me. However, in preparing for this talk, it did occur to me that there are some big issues at areas that are not really being explored. Um, and I'd like to just move the debate on a bit in two of these. One is uh, access to justice, and the other is accuracy of justice, should we say. Um, access to justice, when I was starting out, was a key um, issue. In the 1970s, there was a lot of so-called socio-legal work on access to justice. Um, there were legal aid reforms around the world. Community legal centres um, were developed. Tribunals grew. ADR um, really started to take off. But it's gone relatively quieter uh, in this area now. And I was interested in a chapter in that collection by Dr. Susanna Sage Jacobson on the demand side of civil justice. She says, we know something about what is supplied now, but do we know what people want from a civil justice system and to what extent they can afford to access it? I'm not saying, by the way, that public interest in this has um, gone. When legal aid cuts were proposed quite recently, there was solid resistance and public um, pushback on it, uh, which led to the government backing away to some extent. So the concerns are not dead. But I ask myself, where is the fresh thinking on access to justice? Have we exhausted all the possibilities now, or are there others? And one which I would just float for possible discussion is to think about the way that the HEX system works in higher education. Now, I know HEX has had a bit of a debate recently, and I was a player in it, but put, put that controversy aside. Higher education is thought to have private gain and public good, and that's used to justify a kind of loan scheme related to income levels, or at least repayments are related to income levels. Why is that different from a justice system, where certainly in civil justice there's an element of private gain, but there's also an element of public good in having a functioning justice system? Um, certainly, uh, courts are a better response than retaliation um, to grievance. So is there a capacity for new ways of financing uh, where risk is shared uh, using the same principles as the HEX scheme? So I'll throw that out there. But I'll move on to the second um, topic that I'd like to just raise with you. And this is the accuracy of justice. This was something that um, I wanted to develop when I was in academic life, but I just 
haven't been able to since, but wouldn't mind going back to. Um, and it'll probably irritate people greatly. Um, unless I uh, have missed something, um, there's relatively little systematic research on how often courts get things wrong. I'm not saying it is often, I don't actually know. But my point is that we don't know how often courts might get things wrong. The answer surely can't be never. So it has to be in a spectrum between hardly ever and frequently. But we just don't know where, um, on which point on that spectrum uh, it is. There are some pockets of research interest. Within forensic psychology, there's a lot of work on witnesses' recollection, on identification evidence, on the reliability of uh, expert science evidence and the error rates within science. Also, I think that um, the emerging area of neuroscience um, is also starting to challenge many legal assumptions about responsibility for people's actions, which I think that will um, develop. And of course, where there's been a major miscarriage of justice, there's often a kind of post-mortem, a commission, a report or something which um, prizes it all open. But we don't routinely gather data or think about error rates in courts, and yet they're human institutions, they're there to serve the public, and as I'll say in a moment, most other public service agencies are subject to um, a greater degree of analysis. Now you might be interested in some US work um, about capital offences. Um, by looking at the number of death sentences between 1973 and 2004 that were overturned on appeal by reason of error in the court below, some researchers conclude that perhaps 4% of murder convictions in the United States are false or wrongful. Now, it's easy to dismiss this as irrelevant. It's the United States, it's murder, which is exceptional, it's capital punishment, which we don't have. It has no bearing on anything that we might um, be thinking about. But just think about it for a while. Um, because it's a capital case, uh, one would think that trial courts are trying really hard to get it right in the first place. The defendant will almost certainly have a lawyer, which isn't the fact in many other kinds of proceedings. Um, because they're more likely to be appealed, there's more chance of errors coming to light. And because of the consequences of an appeal decision, which could be execution, every bit of scrutiny is thrown at the trial stage. And yet, 4% are overturned on the basis of error in the, in the, at the trial court stage. Which leads you to conclude that maybe in other kinds of cases, the error rate has to be higher than 4%. If that's where you get to when everyone's really looking hard and trying hard, then what is the error rate in um, other contexts? By the way, as a postscript, um, it appears that convictions with death sentences are much more likely to be appealed against than a convictions with life imprisonment. So one can conclude that the error rate in those life sentence convictions will be higher than 4%. So, as one of the authors says, at least 4% of people serving life sentences for murder in the United States were wrongly uh, convicted. So, as I said, I've hesitated to introduce that material because it just seems so distracting and different from the context um, here. Um, but I think it makes the point efficiently. The fewer resources in time and money that are spent on court proceedings, then presumably the less likelihood that error is picked up somewhere. And if people can't afford lawyers, so that self-represented defendants and litigants increase in number, which I believe to be happening, then the less likely it is that the person affected will pick it up or understand the error uh, themselves. At base, the adversarial system outsources residual error correction to a person's lawyer. But if there is no lawyer, where is the fallback? So far I've focused on incorrect outcomes, error that leads to the wrong decision. Uh, but trials are shaped by multiple decisions along the way and lead up procedures of one kind or another. And if error occurs there on seemingly minor matters, it could have magnified effects later. And of course if people settle their dispute just before the trial, uh, then there isn't any procedure which picks up whether it's a settlement based on incorrect preliminary or earlier rulings. 
Now, compare this state of affairs, which goes to the heart of people's liberty, their safety, their livelihood, with research and inquiry into other public agencies. I'll take my own area as it now is, edu higher education. In education, we are KPI'd to death. We are ranked. There are all kinds of metrics um, about whether students learn anything, um, how often they drop out there, how often they pass at the first attempt and that kind of thing. We're kind of swamped by data. In research, which you might not know about, Australia and some other countries have research evaluation exercises and we're in the middle of one at the moment, um, where all kinds of work is scrutinised by groups of peers and the work itself has probably been through peer, uh, peer review in the first place. So we're coming down with it there. In the health system, waiting lists, um, deaths uh, in surgery, um, which surgeons, days of the week you're more likely to die on the operating table, times of year where it's more risky to be operated upon. Um, so this is the era of big data and analytics. And although there are certainly are KPIs in the justice system and um, time standards, it's hard to say that justice is understood in the same way that other areas of human endeavour in the public sphere are understood. So to conclude, John, um, I'm saying that justice isn't currently a top of mind issue, um, but it should be. I'm asking whether we need, in effect, justice analytics. There are actually some consulting firms now with this in their name, in their title, Justice Analytics. Um, but I'm not aware of it being seen as a field, yet we've got health analytics, we've got health economics. Why don't we have justice analytics and justice economics to really scrutinise it? And my final point is, there's a lot at stake here. Firstly, there's the issue of process values. This is the belief that the more that people see things done carefully, impartially, with respect for the rule of law, the more that rule of law values will, will be spread in the community. But conversely, the less that they see it, then um, the less those values are permeated. Um, there's an educative aspect. Um, in other work that I've done on judicial independence, so few people in the community understand that courts are actually an arm of government, um, that there might be, let's call it three arms of government, and courts are one of them, and it's important. It's hardly understood in the community, but by focusing on justice, perhaps we can educate people better about the makeup of our constitutional democracy. And also, I think, finally, um, if we do focus more on justice and how well it works, we might foster a deeper sense of democracy and involvement. People will feel that this is their society and this is really important. So I do think there's a lot at stake, not just the individual liberty, but the whole social good of feeling part of a functioning and vibrant democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Parker. Our second presentation will be from Dr. Helen Watchius at OAM. I think uh, you're all probably very familiar with the work that um, Helen does, but Helen is the ACT Human Rights and Discrimination Commissioner. She's held that role for 11 years now. Her work has focused on human rights audits of ACT detention facilities. I think it's probably time for another one. Uh, as well as supervising the handling of discrimination, vilification and sexual harassment complaints. Uh, Helen has 33 years experience as a human rights lawyer working for the federal government as an employee expert to several United Nations agencies including UNAIDS, WHO, ILO and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Dr Watchers has a PhD in human rights law and a Masters in public law and HIV AIDS. Thank you very much uh, Helen for being here today. Thanks so much, John. It's a pleasure to be here. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet the Ngunnawal people and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I'll talk generally about the quality of justice and then uh, apply it in the case of the Human Rights Act. You will see at the front desk there are copies of the Human Rights Act, so please uh, take one with you if you don't already have it. And I'll be recommending strengthening the Human Rights Act so that um, it's very clear that it applies to lower courts and tribunals and uh, the possibility of having expressed damages under the Act. The quality of justice has many facets, um, at least eight that I can find. Uh, independence, professional competence of the judiciary, um, the openness of hearings and uh, judgments, 
to have transparency and, and accountability. The actual quality of the arbitration and uh, decision, so the procedure as well as substantive justice. Timeliness of uh, listings, uh, judgments. All familiar with the ACT blitz a few years ago, and uh, just recently it's been announced a fifth judge. Um, I've just come from estimates across the road at the Legislative Assembly. Actually, there was a consultant talking about expertise, saying we can currently justify the caseload of 4.5 judges, and that will go to 4.9 judges. So that's why we got a fifth judge. Um, equal access to ju uh, justice, of course, and having courts being representative, the ACT Supreme Court is 50% female in the uh, figures now. Treating people with dignity and humanity, particularly vulnerable people, uh, unrepresented in litigants, the court can be intimidating and not particularly user friendly and that's something that needs to be worked on. And lastly, and a lot of what Stephen covered is uh, public confidence and trust in the system. Um, media uh, focus on lenience of sentencing, but um, it's really the, the quality of the whole system that is more important. The Human Rights Act uh, guarantees a lot of these facets of the um, quality of justice, uh, fair trial, uh, presumption of innocence, lack of unreasonable delay, presence, personal presence in a hearing that's not done in your absence, legal assistance and being able to examine uh, witnesses. They're all guaranteed under the Human Rights Act. There are some um, KPIs on performance, efficiency uh, and effectiveness collected by uh, Productivity Commission, it's ROCs, things like clearance rates, cost per, per finalisation, uh, attendance, but they don't really get to the core of what uh, Stephen was talking about. I like to talk about the quality of justice being affected by the actual laws that Parliament pass and enforce because um, it's that, that's the way we get um, human rights and the rule of law and democracy uh, strengthened. It's very timely, um, just in, in the last two weeks, we've had the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, and the government is seriously um, testing the community's attitude to human rights and the rule of law. In our recent um, amendment, uh, yesterday a bill was introduced to the Australian Citizenship Act. The initial proposal was that um, the executive could remove citizenship. That has been changed because it's unconstitutional. Um, so now the plan is that um, people can have the citizenship removed automatically um, who are dual nationals by the activity of fighting or supporting uh, 20 declared terrorist groups or having a, a criminal conviction, even a minor one. Um, but the big thing is that it is all subject to judicial review. There is a ministerial discretion for exempting any of those automatic grounds. So there's a lot of debate that needs to be had. What's different between the federal debate and the ACT one is that uh, the Joint Committee on Human Rights hasn't even looked at the bill yet. It's kind of last in the picture. Whereas in the ACT, the evidence has been that um, we look at policy and legislation early on and have a human rights analysis. If you even compare the numbers of bills, we have one main ACT Act and we have 350 pieces of legislation according to George Williams at the federal level. Gillian Triggs has been uh, talking nationally about the uh, ineffectiveness of uh, restraining excessive executive power and an erosion of rights and freedoms without much public debate or um, protest, and that is concerning. We have had a Human Rights Act for 11 years here and has had a big impact in two of the three arms of government, the executive and the legislature, but in my view not as big an impact in the judiciary, and that's something that could change. We know that politicians are seriously looking at human rights just by looking at debates in the Legislative Assembly. They consider them routinely. The Committee on Scrutiny of Bills um, reports are routinely referred to. Last year alone, there were about 100 amendments to government bills, seven government bills, just in one year. If you compare the statistics of Victoria, which has a charter of human rights, it's only had eight government amendments in eight years. So very different. This better law and policy means we've got better protection for vulnerable people and more transparency and accountability of executive action. But I don't see this reflected in the courts. Under the Human Rights Act, the courts have three functions. First, you must have human rights um, consistent interpretation of ACT laws. Second, only the Supreme Court can issue a declaration of incompatibility 
that says this law is so incompatible with human rights we can't possibly interpret it consistently. There's only been one in the history of uh, the last 11 years. And lastly, an amendment in 2009 that improved the Human Rights Act that gave citizens the power to have a direct access to the Supreme Court uh, against a breach of a human rights by a public authority and um, for any relief to be given by the Supreme Court except for damages. So the impact has been felt in the courts. It's been mentioned, the Human Rights Act, in over 200 cases and about over 50 tribunal decisions. Um, this is actually quite a big percentage. Um, the Human Rights Commission uh, performed a, a report last year in time for our uh, 10th anniversary of the Human Rights Act forum. And um, about 8 to 9 per cent of ACT Supreme Court and Court of Appeal cases mention the Human Rights Act, and half that number, about 4 per cent, in the ACT. So the ACT has a, a small volume, um, but a larger percentage. The Victoria has a much bigger number of cases, but a smaller percentage. There have only been 14 cases under the new um, power since 2009 of having direct action to the Supreme Court. The one um, Declaration of Incompatibility that was issued by Justice Penfold in 2010 in the case of Islam um, con concerned bail laws, and we haven't had that bail law amended yet. That the part of the Act that was found not to be human rights compliant was actually introduced before the Human Rights Act came into power in 2004, so it escaped um, that protection. But it's still something that needs fixing, and similarly in Victoria, the case of Mom Sillery has a, a, a criminal law that still stands that should be amended. So the two ways I propose um, to strengthen the consideration of human rights in the judicial arm, the third arm of government, is firstly enabling lower courts to litigate human rights issues. We know that the Supreme Court is uh, the most expensive and lengthy jurisdiction, so to have it as an unsettled area of law is not good for the public. Uh, last year I intervened in a Supreme Court matter with um, Shane Gill, LM, against the Children's Court. It was um, before Master Mossop, and uh, he held that there was only an express power to grant relief to the Supreme Court, but it could use inherent um, jurisdictions to grant remedies, and he even made a concession that's not binding, but it was a comment that courts could consider factors beyond the traditional scope of remedies that existed before the Human Rights Act or apart from the Human Rights Act. The problem is, with the law being unsettled, it would be much better if we had um, coherence and clarity in the Act that a minor amendment could fix this. Uh, that would mean that lower courts and tribunals who are more cost effective, are very more, much more specific in the jurisdictions, things like tenancy, cases, eviction in the ACAT or discrimination cases, mean that that um, specialist area is able to weigh out the impact of a breach and what it does to a person's actual enjoyment of rights and how that could actually be uh, remedied. So you have a more cost-effective and accessible jurisdiction with a broader range of cases and many more advocates involved in that dialogue. In terms of damages, the ACT and Victoria are unique in the world in not having damages for breaches of human rights. Um, New Zealand has an implied damages, although it's not been used that much. The UK Human Rights Act 1998 actually has an express right to remedy, but it's fairly constrained. You have to have an existing remedy that's inadequate. There must be a causal connection between the loss from the breach. And lastly, uh, there has to be gravity in what's happened to you in terms of non-pecuniary uh, damages being awarded. I think if the ACT government is seriously um, wanting more dialogue about human rights, then the best way to do that would be to make uh, breaches of human rights more amenable to uh, judicial review. I've previously recommended that the Human Rights Commission have a complaints mechanism similar to discrimination, but I think it's probably more likely that um, we could explore an amendment to make it very clear that the Human Rights Act applies to lower courts and tribunals. We know that that um, could create more of a dialogue and the benefit would of course be uh, an improved quality of justice for all Canberrans, uh, particularly vulnerable people. The 2012 Legal Australia Wide Survey of 2,000 people in every jurisdiction, so that includes the ACT, 2,000 people were interviewed. And the reasons they gave for not pursuing legal action were firstly, the length of time. Secondly, they had bigger problems than legal ones. Third, stress, and lastly, costs. 
And it was very interesting to know that vulnerable populations such as Aboriginal people and um, uh, culturally and linguistically diverse populations were the people most likely not to take legal action because of those barriers. And I think quality of justice would be served if we had these minor amendments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I um, just on that uh, that last point in relation to the extent to which some uh, 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 some communities, and most particularly the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community, actually engage with the um, with with legal justice or with the legal system. I met recently with the uh, Commission for, for for Victims, John Hinchy, about the extent to which. Um, Aboriginal people or people within the Abri Aboriginal community make claims for um, under the victims of crime um, legislation. And it's very interesting that we're all very, very aware that Indigenous people uh, are vastly overrepresented within the criminal justice system, most particularly as perpetrators. Indeed, uh, currently 26 or thereabout percent of the people within Alexander McConaughey are Aboriginal from a base of 1.7%. Uh, it's also a fact, of course, that uh, people within the Aboriginal community are the most offended against uh, people within the community. Indeed, I read, I think, just the other day that an Aboriginal woman is, I think, 30 times more likely to be the subject of uh, domestic violence or assault than a non-Aboriginal woman. And yet the Commissioner tells me that uh, he almost never receives applications from the Aboriginal community uh, for, um, for compensation or actually action under the Victims of Crime legislation, which is very interesting for us. Our third speaker today is um, Shane Gill. Shane um, studied law at the uh, ANU, completed the workshop there in 1992, uh, and uh, I think began his legal career as a uh, domestic violence duty lawyer in the ACT Magistrates Court. Actually, the only time that I've practised as a lawyer, in fact, was in the same office in the same court when I was made redundant in 1996 and was looking for a, an, another future and another life. <coughs> I tried law and then sort of fell into politics. Um, in 2003, uh, Shane was a founding member of uh, the Burley Griffin Chambers here in Canberra. He appears now in the the local children's uh, magistrates, family, federal, federal circuit, district, supreme courts, and the, the Court of Appeal and the High Court of Australia. Shane is currently the president of the ACT Bar Association, and indeed, on meeting um, Shane just recently in my capacity as president of the uh, Legal Aid Commission of the ACT, it was Shane that suggested to me that he felt um, it would be uh, appropriate if we could actually talk more in this community about the quality of justice. So it was Shane that suggested uh, this particular topic today and I'm very grateful, Shane, that you're able to join us and to make a presentation. And I'm glad that you're facilitating this uh, dialogue because it's dialogue that I've come to speak about today. Um, I'm gonna pose a hypothesis for you to think about. And that is the, the way that we talk and think about uh, a subject depends very much upon our sense of connection with that subject. I'll give you a fairly innocuous example to start with, uh, an example of travel. Um, many people here have probably travelled. What I'm going to suggest to you is that how you think or talk about a particular place changes very much depending on a particular aspect um, of uh, that, and that is it changes dependent on, upon whether you've ever been to the place or whether you ever plan to go to the place. Um, the fact that you've travelled somewhere or the fact that you're planning to travel somewhere tends to give you a sense of engagement in respect of that place. I don't want to stretch the idea too far, but what I'll suggest is um, the fact that you've travelled somewhere or the fact that you're planning to travel somewhere changes your talk about that place from something which is quite abstract to an engagement with a consideration of the, of the qualities of the place that you've travelled to. If you've been to a country, you think in a completely different way about that country or if you're planning to go there, you think in a completely different way to if you've never gone there, have no interest in going there at all. 
what I'm going to suggest to you is that your sense of connection changes the way that you think about it to be a, a qualitative assessment of that place. Um, let, let me give you um, what might be a more salient example for our uh, topic. Uh, consider how it is that we think about the health services or the hospital services. Uh, there are uh, an institution in our community that has a similar sort of status to uh, the legal system. Uh, they're considered to be a, an essential part of our community. How is it that we think or talk about something like the health system compared to how it is that we think or talk about the legal system? And what I'm going to suggest to you is that the nature of our discourse about the health system is different. And one of the reasons that it is different is because our sense of connection to the health system is, differs from our sense of connection to the legal system. And what I'll suggest is that what we learn from the comparison about how we think about the health system or discuss the health system to the way that we think about the legal system is of an utmost importance as we as a community seek to maintain and develop and improve uh, the legal system. So when we do think or talk about the health system, how do we do it? Well, uh, I'll suggest that there's something that we don't do. We don't ever divorce a discussion of efficiency from a discussion of the quality of treatment that's going to be afforded to the individual. Uh, what, why is that? It's probably intuitively obvious to you now. Um, we each understand that poor quality treatment being given to a patient can never be efficient, no matter how the numbers stack up. The objective of the health system always has to be to administer healing, to make people well. That, that's the quality that we want in a health system and that's the quality that we strive for. There's no point treating a large number of people cheaply and not getting them well. Uh, that's, a, that's a nonsense when it comes to assessing how something like the health system works. Um, further than that, we don't divorce quality of treatment from the manner of treatment of an individual. So when we consider the health system, we don't tolerate the fact that people are getting better um, if that's at the expense of the dehumanising of a patient or the disrespecting of a patient or even the abuse of a patient. Um, we, we have a natural recognition when we think about something like the health system that it can't be considered in a single dimensional manner. Um, you can't consider a single dimension of efficiency without also examining quality of treatment. You can't consider quality of results without also considering how it is that patients are treated. Why is it that we think about the health system in that manner? What, what, what is it about the health system that causes us to think about it that way? I'll re return to the uh, original thesis. We think about the health system in that manner um, because we can connect with the idea of being a participant in the health system. Um, I, I could be sick, I might need an operation. I have needed operations. Uh, my parents could be sick, my children could need to go to hospital, my friends might need to go to hospital, my wife might need to go to hospital. That reality is something which is within our minds. We know that we could end up in a hospital. We know that normal people that we associate with could end up in a hospital. The connection for us with the health system is a much easier connection for us to make. We can readily picture our engagement with that system and we know that without any fault of our own, we could end up being a part of that system. We know that we, or we know that those that we love, might end up in hospital, and that such an occurrence is a real picture within our thoughts of something that could happen. Because of that, because we have that connection with the system, we understand it's not good enough just to speak of efficiency within the system. We want healing. And it's not good enough to speak just of healing. We want to be treated with respect because we can comprehend and connect with the idea that one day we might be involved. Let me contrast that with how we might think about the legal system. Um, do we ever picture ourselves becoming entangled in the legal system? Um, do we picture for our children that they might be dragged into the legal system, or our friends might, or our parents, or our workmates? Do we harbour a sneaking suspicion that, unlike the health system, people only become involved in the legal system because they are somehow at fault themselves or blameworthy? 
those who are involved in the legal system, and partic particularly the criminal system, do we consider them as others to ourselves? They're not our people. Our friends don't become involved in the legal system. Our family won't become involved in the legal system. The people who are involved in the legal system, who are brought into it, they're others to us. They're not our associates, they're not our intimates, they're a foreign body. We're not connected because we've not been there and we have no intention of travelling to the legal system for ourselves. Unlike considering a patient in the health system um, who could be us, it could be the place that we travel to, those involved in the legal system are others to us, they're remote from us. Now because of that lack of connection, there is a grave risk that our discourse or our thoughts about the legal system will have a tendency to become stunted. A tendency for the discourse to be dealt with in very much a one-dimensional um, sense and to be dealt with in a one-dimensional way that we would not tolerate if we were going to speak about something like the health system. The grave risk of it becoming one-dimensional, um, what, what do I mean by that? What I'd ask each of you to do is to consider for yourselves what you consider to be the dominant elements of discourse about the legal system. Now, what I'm going to say here is not universal. Um, I speak with some respect to Mr Inman, who is often reporting here on the legal system and who I don't think falls foul of this, but consider what the dominant discourse is when the legal system is spoken about. What is it? Um, particularly when we're talking about reform. Uh, one, law and order. Two, protection of the community. Three, efficiency of proceedings. I'm going to suggest to you that those, it's not exhaustive, but those form components of the dominant discourse about law reform in the Territory. When we allow um, that to be the discourse, those one-dimensional features to be the discourse, law and order, protection of the community and efficiency, what we do to the legal system is that we depart from a focus on the key quality of something that we want to call a justice system. What is the key quality of something that we want to call a justice system? Um, first, foremost, always, that the focus will be on the system providing actual justice. What happens then if we reduce our discourse to a series of one-dimensional concepts, law and order, protection of the community or efficiency? Unless they sit immediately behind a discourse of justice, they harm what we do to the justice system. I'll give you, give you an example. Um, if we consider what happens when you divorce protection of the community from the administration of justice. And a concrete example I'll give you relates to the Bail Act. Helen's touched upon that already. We have a Bail Act which has been declared to be incompatible with our Human Rights Act. It's incompatible because it says that certain classes of accused persons cannot even argue the merits of their bail case unless they meet a threshold of special or exceptional circumstances. Unless you show that there are some special circumstances to your case, it doesn't matter that you're not a risk to the community. It doesn't matter that you're not a risk of flight. It doesn't matter that the charges against you are unproven. Your bail application cannot even be considered. The merits of it cannot even be considered. Now, if that's justified on the basis of protection of the community, consider what happens when you actually start looking at it through a justice viewpoint. Every time you lock someone up who doesn't need to be locked up, then two things are happening. One is you're working injustice upon that person. And the second is, despite the fact that it might be justified on the basis of protection of the community, you are harming the community because you're locking up someone who does not need to be. You're not protecting the community, you're harming the community. But because this is justified simply through a perspective of protection of the community, without looking at it adequately through a prism of justice, you don't get the full picture. Along the same lines, every time someone is convicted who is in fact innocent, you harm the person, you do injustice and you harm the community. Now generally, each time the government introduces efficiencies to the justice system, you can take efficiency to be a code for this, that it will be something which will reduce the ability of the accused to test the evidence, 
And the bottom line of the bulk of procedural matters is that it does reduce the ability of an accused to test evidence. Every time you introduce an efficiency without considering properly the impact that it has on a justice outcome, you decrease the ability of an accused to test the evidence, you increase the risk that an innocent person will be found guilty, you increase the risk of injustice, and every time you have an innocent person being found guilty, you harm the community, you do not protect it, you do not aid it. At what point do we want to tolerate efficiency at the expense of justice? Why would we tolerate such one-dimensional thinking? We don't tolerate it in the health system. Why do we fall prey to it in the justice system? Is it because when we have discourse about the justice system, we allow this sense of unconnectedness to prevail upon our thinking? That sense that it's not us, it's others, is that what enables us to tolerate such a one-dimensional analysis? If you ask these people, if you ask the parent of a teen son who has wrongly been charged for involvement in a fracas in the civic late at night, if you look at your workmate who's litigating in a family court about his or her children, or if you're a business person whose cash flow means you're about to go belly up because people will not pay their accounts, then you begin to have a sense that the justice system can't really be considered as simply being about others. At that point, don't you begin to see that the justice system is as essential as a hospital bed? If it is as essential as a hospital bed, ought we not think about it in the same way, ought we not have the same discourse about it? Ought our discourse not primarily be about the quality of justice and not reduced to one-dimensional concepts such as law and order, protection of the community, and efficiency. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Shane, for that. I think uh, it was quite a fascinating series of speeches today, and um, I do hope that the debate and the conversation goes a bit further. Good day, John Wilson, my name, I'm the CEO of the Legal Aid Commission. Really a Just question a for uh, question. Stephen Parker. Um, one of the issues that I'm often faced with, and, and Dan, I was just across the road, as Helen was, just uh, a short while ago. Uh, the question for me often is, well, OK, you're acting for these people, but helping them, but how many people aren't you helping? And it seems to me that there's an inherent problematic in the notion of access to justice. And it's about where we draw lines and how we draw lines. Do you think this is insoluble? Or is it just something that Shane, as Shane might say, it's about changing our discourse. If we change our discourse uh, a little bit more, uh, we might ask better questions. Well, I think um, soluble might be an ambitious claim, but can it be better or worse? Definitely. And I think we've been through periods in our society where people have had better access uh, to justice. And I think um, there have been improvements as well. So the introduction of tribunals, which didn't really feature in uh, the discussion um, here, you know, it could be one of those. But we have, or in many countries, have had better legal aid than they now have. So I don't know about soluble, but you can move the line um, in a positive direction. Um, but in addition, we can keep on thinking about what we mean by justice and you know, what amounts to the solution of a legal problem. Um, and there used to be debate about this. So I, can, I think one of my other points is that we've stopped debating um, what legal need is and what redress really means for people. Thanks very much. So there, we don't have all that much time for questions today, but we can take a few. Uh, if we can just there are a couple more. Um, so we do have to have quite quick, direct questions, thanks. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, brilliant speakers, Helen, thank you, uh, Shane and uh, Stephen. We do have a reasonably good justice system here, but I, I speak, uh, my name's Shobha Barkin, I'm the Vice President of Prisoners Aid. I've uh, been uh, do, doing working with prisoners for, for the last 15 years. Um, legal Aid, uh, thank you. you, you do a fantastic job. Uh, they're over inundated. We need more money for legal aid. Uh, they are so swamped, they can barely 
do justice to their clients. Um, discrimination still exists, and uh, especially with Aboriginal issues, as you touched on. Why do we still have such a high rate of incarceration for Aboriginal youth and Aboriginal people in the uh, Alexander McConaughey Centre? The other two points are prisoners and people with disabilities, uh, and people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. So Helen, what can we do to improve our human rights in those areas? And Shane, fantastic uh, discourse. How do we get people to understand that just locking people up isn't going to solve the justice system and actually harming our society? And how can we just stop locking people up and spending $130,000 per person per year and have more preventative measures? We do have a justice reinvestment strategy happening, and I'd like to see all three of you please participate. Those are my questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I certainly support the justice reinvestment strategy, and I'm involved in that advisory group. Um, it's about instead of spending money on bigger prisons, it's putting money in early to prevent people becoming offenders. Uh, youth justice is an important area. Um, we looked at Pompey and Minbury. Our recommendations uh, were taken seriously, and the number of children at Minbury halved by opening up a bio after our service. In relation to Populations like the Aboriginal population, the Bail Act is a problem. Um, people are assumed to have committed offences and if you become part of the system, it's hard to get out of the system. So re-offending is a very important area and there has been a big investment on um, true care when people leave AMC. So it's really, you want to prevent people getting in there and you need to start that early in families, you need to start it when young people come up against the justice system. And when people in the justice system, particularly we've got a high um, community interest in preventing domestic violence, people in AMC who have those convictions should be working on them therapeutically. And I don't think that's happening enough. I think people's time there is not being used sufficiently well. But certainly on the list, there is an investment there um, that offenders have been, been given housing jobs and uh, so that they have a route out of the justice system. So that, that's my answer. Um, and there are answers to both ways through current legislative reform. The attorneys sponsored a, uh, an inquiry into the sentencing process, well, which has got participation from uh, victims of crime, it's got participation from the bar, from the law society from academia and a number of other groups, and that's showing every sign of producing something which will help divert people from prisons. But at the same time that's happening, we have the closing down the period of detention, which was a way of keeping people out of course on prison, and proposals floating around, which tends to move towards more punitive systems and more punitive regimes. So that's one step forward and one step back. If you're going to combat the steps back with them, I think, it does involve the change in community discourse. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, well, Mark. Uh, uh, do, do ACT citizens know enough about their, their rights under the Human Rights Act? And do ACT office holders know enough about their responsibilities under the Human Rights Act? I guess so. <laughs> well, we've actually got an um, electronic um, uh, learning system about the Human Rights Act for Public Servants and this week um, the end of financial year will be awarding departments over the highest percentage of the staff who have done the training. Um, after all years, I think there's been a good culture of respect for human rights areas, but um, we have done own motion inquiries into education, charging fees to refugee children on asylum seekers. Um, we'd like to look at housing, public housing in terms of evictions of vulnerable people, such as people with disabilities. There's a lot of work to be done there, but certainly I think um, ACT is ahead of the game than other jurisdictions. One more question. Was well, the gentleman at the back and then we'll take those two and then it'll be it. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, look, I've got a question, and it's been touched on, and it's around the ability to pay the legal services, and I think the subject of quality of that service comes down to often how much people can afford the legal services and 
you know, when you consider some quality of legal service and the representatives that they have can charge as much as some people make in a week, in an hour, uh, it's very difficult to associate that quality with the sort of representation that they want. And I think the fundamental flaws and inherent flaws in that um, lead to a lot of issues in relation to uh, a really protracted um, system. And I've seen some really bad examples where, and, and this leads also to people who have to represent themselves, where magistrates have actually zeroed in on that individual and actually, um, because they haven't understood the process, um, really gone, gone to town because they're not legal you know, representatives. And it's really difficult. And I've actually seen that. And, and I'm just interested, I think it sort of covers the three speakers that have been here today, but I don't really know who to direct it to, probably Shane, maybe, but uh, um, you know, this whole aspect of quality of, of, the, of the justice system when it comes down to money and how much you can afford to pay, uh, it's a really tricky issue. And I know legal aid is really struggling, um, but you know, it's been touched on as well, but you know, how do we fix that? Because at the moment, it's not a just system when it comes down to how much you can pay the capacity to pay. And I don't think it just comes down to how much and what your capacity is, because you can pay a fortune and get represented badly, <coughs> or a reasonably small amount and get represented well. I don't think that there's an, an, an easy solution for it. Um, both the solicitors and barristers branches of the practice put significant work into continuing professional development for um, for lawyers, but it's a very small pool of actually practicing lawyers. When you look at the number of graduates who, who um, finish law degrees, and even when you look at the number of people who finish law degrees and go into practice, there's a massive attrition rate. Um, it's a very uh, difficult area to sustain working. And I think part of the concept of what you're talking about is that it's a very arduous process of being in court and pursuing justice. Um, I don't have a fix for these, I'm afraid. Stephen, I. The point's well made. We'll just have just one last question. Thank you. Just a simple question, and uh, it's going back to the recent, uh, we say events happening in the Parliament House, the uh, federal Parliament. It's more about the problem, uh, political arm making changes to some of the uh, uh, legislation, legislation, which might have impact retrospective, with, with retrospectively on the case which is in court at the moment. It may or may not have impact on outcome, but it could be seen as trying to uh, make the legislation more tighter so that outcome problems don't go against the government. So in the uh, aspect of justice accuracy, how does that fit in that definition of justice accuracy? If you change in the legislation to get a certain type of outcome, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it could. I'm not sure about accuracy. I mean, in, in some ways, um, I'm more close to predetermining the outcome. You're improving accuracy. You're just not improving justice. Um, all I can say is that uh, I would deplore the political culture at the moment, which is slipping into populist disregard for rule of law um, values. And I think lawyers should be standing up, as some are, but we should be doing more to stand up against it, because we're on the brink of sliding from sort of diluted populism to some real populism where um, rights really are abrogated. And I think Australia is actually in a dangerous period at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, on that, uh, we'll conclude today. I'll take uh, this opportunity on the behalf to thank um, Stephen, Shane, and Helen for um, attending today and for their presentation, which I think were all really quite excellent.